All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Kathy Fong, and I'm the Membership and Operations Manager at Philanthropy Network Greater Philadelphia. But I'm also here today as an Executive Committee member of the Giving Circle of Color. I'm excited to welcome you all and thank you for joining this session, Community-Led Philanthropy During Crisis, How Giving Circles of Color Can Inform Traditional Philanthropy. This session is being recorded and will be made available on our website afterwards. Today is a continuation of ongoing conversations between the Philadelphia Black Giving Circle, Asian Mosaic Fund Giving Circle of Greater Philadelphia, as well as the Philadelphia chapter of APIP, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, and Philanthropy. So members of these organizations, including some of today's speakers, spoke at Change Philanthropy's Unity Summit in 2017, and more recently again during a roundtable chat at Philanthropy Network's Sparks Conference last fall. And what brings us here today is the current social unrest and crises in America, including anti-Black racism, anti-Asian racism, and the structural injustices in our systems, all against the backdrop of COVID-19. And we want to take this time to talk about how giving, of cir giving circles of color in particular have mobilized within their own communities and how their community-centered lenses and practices can inform and intersect with um, traditional philanthropy. Uh, we will have time for Q&A at the end, um, and while everyone has been placed on mute, we welcome you to utilize the chat box for questions and answers, or questions and discussion. Uh, so with that, I am very pleased to introduce our moderator today, um, a man who wears many hats. James Liu is a Senior Director at Equal Measure, uh, co-chair of APIP Philadelphia, but more importantly, he's here today in his capacity as a member of Philanthropy Network's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. James, take it away. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, and thank you to our panelists um, and to everyone else who also is calling in this morning, uh, this rainy day. Um, I don't know about you, I still feel like I'm getting used to um, <laughs> working straight from home and um, I miss being in physical proximity to um, a lot of my friends who are on this call um, and others and colleagues. So um, there's that, thank you for doing that. Um, I will also say, um, a real um, heartfelt thank you as well for choosing to be here. Um, there is a lot that's happening now um, in our professional lives, our personal lives, um, in Greater Philadelphia, across the nation and world. Um, you have a lot of options. Um, and the fact that you decided to be here for this part of this conversation means a lot. Um, and we hope this is not the beginning and end of it, but a continuation. And we welcome you to this conversation and community. So, like Kathy mentioned, uh, I just wanted to share um, a few points um, and a tip of the hat um, absolutely to Kathy for helping to really shape and inform this um, into Philanthropy Network for hosting it. Um, there now, I um, can't believe it's mid-June already, uh, but in mid-June, we are in this context now of, of shifting from a global pandemic uh, of COVID-19 um, to a real intensification um, in powerful ways of, of Black Lives Matter. Um, and they both feed and inform each other, but that's something we wanted to name that giving circles actually live really at the center of in a lot of different ways. And particularly important um, for Black Americans who for too many um, are at the receiving end of this complexity and intersectionality, right? Health issues, disproportionate impacts, um, structural racism, murder at the hands of um, uh, the police, uh, all sorts of issues like that are disproportionately, I would say, affecting um, black citizens in this country, super problematic. For Asians and Asian American Pacific Islanders, other sets of issues. There's invisibility. Are we even part of the conversation? Um, is ethnicity a virus, right? In what ways are Asian American um, community members recipients of prejudice and hate crimes and blame um, in terms of this national context? Those are real things that these giving circles are addressing and that's like a real context for us. Two, um, giving circles have close ties to community. I'm looking at your excellent notes here, Kathy. Um, and part of what is a compelling model that I think the panelists will bring up here is um, leadership from within those communities um, really is, and decision-making really is at the heart of the Giving Circle model. 
and it's not only intended um, to be sort of one that shares power and decision responsibilities, but also has some of the deepest relationships to community members that otherwise are invisible to traditional philanthropy for lots of different reasons that we'll get into. Three, in terms of context, um, what is the relationship between giving circles and traditional philanthropy? Um, there are a lot of folks on this call now who um, uh, live and work in traditional philanthropic spaces um, that do um, a lot of effort and in many cases a lot of good work to try to have uh, positive impact on community members. Um, in what ways does community philanthropy, people of color-led philanthropy, giving circles, participatory grant making, how does that fit into the traditional philanthropy context? Um, and then fourth I will say that um, you probably know there is still a persistent disparity in terms of funding from traditional philanthropy that go to um, people of color led organizations and oftentimes people of color are serving organizations or ones that take very much sort of an anti-racist or DEI sort of vision and perspective and work at its heart of the organization and that's an issue as well. So there are lots of contexts here that we'd love to touch upon um, and we have some four terrific um, colleagues and I'd say friends as well who are going to lead this conversation with us. Um, so what I'd like to do is do some brief introductions. Uh, we have a couple of questions, about seven or eight um, really good questions to kind of really get at a lot of these issues. We'll go to a Q&A um, and we'll have a little bit of wrap up by the panelists, sort of final word, and then we'll, we'll see you next time. So, um, in no particular order, um, I'd like to start first with um, our panelist, Dwayne Wharton, um, who is a steering committee member at the Philadelphia Black Giving Circle, or PBGC. He's the founder of a new organization called Just Strategies. Check them out. Um, and he, at the Philadelphia uh, Philanthropy Network, um, has a number of leadership roles. He's a board member, um, and he's also a co-chair of the DEI committee, of which I am also a part. Welcome, Dwayne, and thanks for joining us. Good morning, thanks. Absolutely. We have Chanel Ransom. Good morning, Chanel, uh, who is also a steering committee member of the Philadelphia Black Giving Circle. She is a program officer at the Samuel S. Fells Fund and is also a co-chair of the DEI Committee at Philanthropy Network. Welcome, Chanel. We, ha we have um, Peter Van Do. Um, welcome, Peter. Um, he is the chair of the Asian Mosaic Fund Giving Circle, or AMF, of Greater Philadelphia. He's the director of the Pan-Asian American Community House, or PAACH, um, at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's also a lecturer in the Asian American Studies at UPenn. Uh, welcome, Peter. And uh, last and certainly not least, um, Melissa Kim. Um, welcome, Melissa. Um, she is the co-chair of the Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in Philanthropy Philadelphia chapter, or APIP, um, and is also the deputy director of LISC Philadelphia. Um, so welcome. And I also do want to acknowledge um, a number of the people who are dialed in now to the call. We won't have time to kind of have everyone introduce themselves by name, um, but we have a, a really strong and also intimate uh, group of folks representing executive director leadership at Philanthropies, um, different community organizations and nonprofits. Um, so thank you and thank you for joining us. So um, what I'd love to do um, is just frame this up a little bit super quickly and then I promise I will turn this over to our, to our wonderful panelists. Um, let's rethink uh, traditional philanthropy together. Um, and let's think about what it does well and what it doesn't do well. And let's think about what giving circles um, have to do um, with that conversation and th these issues. Um, I, I'm really hoping to kind of really broaden the conversation to not just think about philanthropy as professional philanthropy uh, from institutions, but what does it mean when we have a broader definition of what it is where people of color in particular are empowered to make decisions and receive funds in ways that currently are not happening? I will say too that a lot of us do represent traditional philanthropy and um, I will say um, I'd love to have like a real targeted real conversation among friends and colleagues um, but also one that is exploratory and you know there's a notion that um, 
you just don't get better unless you are self-reflective. <laughs> and we take a hard look at ourselves and the organizations that we work for and represent, because uh, I think there's opportunity to improve there as well. So um, let's start um, with context. And uh, if I could start with uh, uh, the Philadelphia Black Giving Circle representatives, Dwayne or Chanel, um, would love to get a sense of how and why um, did your Giving Circle form? And what led to your current funding cycle that you're currently um, leading now? Okay, um, Chanel, that's tag team. So since I'm the old head on the call, I'll, I'll start talking about how we were formed and maybe you can get into where we are today. Got it. And I, yep. Um, and I also want to shout out to Lisa Jackson, who is very well known to our local philanthropic community, who is also uh, one of the original founders and on the steering committee as well. Um, so, Teresa, if we get it wrong, please unmute yourself and correct us. Um, so, I think how we started um, was not with a, in a very linear way. Um, it really happened um, out of the need to support one another in terms of black men, specifically, who were in philanthropy and who were struggling. Um, so I'm going to name names. Uh, Steve Vassar and Phil Fitzgerald kind of sent a group message. I didn't even, even know Steve at the time, actually, um, and said, let's meet and talk about some of the issues that we are seeing happening in philanthropy, particularly the struggles that they were having as staff members within institutions. Um, we knew through data that Philanthropic institutions have a hard time attracting, advancing, and retaining people of color, and there are lots of reasons behind that. So we started the Black Philanthropic Network, which was really a support to the staff members who were working in philanthropic institutions, as well as um, a way for Black trustees, which I was at the time, to have their backs when we we're trying to think about how to incorporate these elements of diversity and equity and make this a good place for black people within the sector. Um, from that, a larger conversation grew out just around the black community in general and how, you know, given the work of the African American Leadership Forum, which, which really looked at uh, the disparity in giving that black led organizations in Philadelphia were facing as it related to their uh, their funds received from foundations and looked at that huge disparity and gave lots of reasons behind it. But we wanted to be intentional about filling that gap. We to recognize that black led black serving organizations were not getting their fair share. And that we could really mobilize our privilege that we have as people who are, you know, socially connected and have these positions and, and big degrees and all these things and resources within our networks to really try to drive dollars to Black-led, Black-serving organizations. So we formed the Giving Circle um, using the model of collective giving, um, supporting each other, self-sustainability, like all these great things. And you know, we had a Giving Cycle that uh, began in 2018. We gave uh, you know, $30,000 out to six organizations in 2019. Um, and I think the biggest thing out of that was the recognition and an appreciation of those organizations of recognizing their plight, but also having people who look like them and have these experiences which are common support them as well. So it just meant more coming from our communities. And we had lots of support, not just from black people. We had some larger institutions that were supportive as well. As a matter of fact, the Asian Mosaic Fund helped seed us and get us started. Um, Wells Fargo contributed um, as well. So uh, the Clanil Foundation. So lots of support coming from larger philanthropy, but the power was because we were giving and supporting each other, which leads us to today. That's terrific, Dwayne. Thank you for that. And Chanel, anything about sort of the current sort of cycle that you're focusing on and what you're, you're hoping to, to, to do with your current funding cycle? Yeah, um, and thank you, Dwayne, for that. So after the first kind of cycle, it obviously took a lot to get it off the ground and keep it moving. And 
there was a bit of a break and we are now kind of back and moving really strong, but felt the need to come back in this moment due to a lot of the media and language and reality of COVID-19 and how the Black community is being hit disproportionately, the disparities in testing, the disparities in access, and also the reality of who is on the front lines and who is considered essential workers and who isn't, and who has the luxury of staying at home and working and who cannot. So this was really a natural moment of we have to show up for our community um, and we have to act quickly. So our current campaign is a COVID-19 response and a justice campaign. Um, and we have two beneficiaries of the fund with a fundraising goal of $50,000. And we're kind of coming to the end. Um, June 15th is the end of the campaign, but really asking for any dollar amount to be able to put back into our community. So one grantee is the um, Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium, who is going into community and testing and primarily Black communities. Um, the, it was self-funded um, in the beginning. Earlier this week, the city gave them a contract, um, and they've also been fundraising and being able to elevate not only the health disparities in the African-American community, but what is happening with COVID-19 and really able to be a voice um, to share some of the Black um, stories from, from the community. The other grantee for this campaign is the Philadelphia Community Bell Fund, which is actively working to get people out of prison. Um, and they've been around for a few years and more recently, since the end, about the end of May, they were able to free about 146 people. Um, and really, they do other things around advocacy and ending the mass incarceration, uh, uh, mass incarceration, and also kind of the 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 private prisons, all of that. Um, and they worked on the campaign to defund the police, but really kind of general advocacy. Um, but the dollars will be used to bail people out directly because we do know that you can't really social distance in prison. Um, there isn't widespread testing in the facilities. Um, and we also know that cash bail prevents folks from going home before their um, tr actual trial. So although the system says that you're innocent until proven guilty, it doesn't always feel like that. And there's um, a reality around that. Thank you, Chanel. And just to kind of round out that question, um, Asian Mosaic Fund, uh, Peter and Melissa, can you give us a little bit of a, a story of, of where AMF came from and what the current activities are with your current funding cycle? James, I'm going to defer to Melissa on this. Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll start, Peter, and uh, you can uh, bring us up to uh, bring bring us up the current, um, you know, current events. Um, uh, the Asian Mosaic Fund, <clears throat> excuse me, started about 10 years ago, and it was really at the, with the encouragement and support of the larger APIP national organization. Um, they um, recognized that um, there was a tremendous disparity in funding, um, where they estimated that less than 1% of API led and serving organizations across the country were receiving philanthropic dollars. And so a natural um, or a, a one response to that uh, disparity was to say, well, we're going to create our own, um, you know, um, avenues um, for, um, for philanthropy. And so I think the idea was largely, one, the market failure of philanthropy, um, you know, um, you know, and informed by all of the systemic issues that go along that underlie that. And then two, there was this idea that philanthropy is not just something that, you know, that we should be receiving, right? That this was in a, like a self-empowerment initiative. So, and also, and it involved like tapping into our own, you know, um, uh, uh, philanthropy. The idea was that philanthropy is not something that is given to you from this external outside source, but rather we can look to our own communities pool our own resources, make our own decisions as to who, you know, 
who we could be supporting um, in this, you know, as a, as a, um, as a vehicle for mutual aid. And so um, we received support from seed money from um, APIP National, um, as well as some seed money from the Philadelphia Foundation. They provided like a matching pool. So, um, and within that, you know, it was up to AMF to self-organize and, and a lot of, it provided an opportunity for a lot of um, folks who aren't traditionally like professional philanthropists or in the nonprofit world to come together and be a part of this um, giving circle. And so um, it broadened the concept of what philanthropy is and who can do it and not, and, and um, so um, I think that has been um, one of the primary benefits and, and Peter can talk more about how, what he's done and what his generation of um, AMF efforts has done to, to really um, build, this, um, build this social network um, around the giving circle. Yeah, thanks Melissa. And I just wanna say that in part of our history, the first donor for the Asian Mosaic Fund happened to be a, a close partner within the community, but also a non-Asian American. Uh, in this case, it happens to be a, a black, uh, you know, individual American uh, who gave our first donation. And uh, Dwayne mentioned earlier, uh, I was part of that meeting uh, when they were developing the Black Gaming Circle, and uh, Maylee Walker, who is uh, one of our co-founders, actually made, gave the first donation to the Black Gaming Circle as well. And that has been, you know, very, I'm choking up just thinking about it. But uh, that 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 is a you know something that you know that I I really appreciate uh, is this sort of like building this foundation uh, between um, you know both uh, Black and Asian Americans uh, here in Philadelphia. I in regards to moving over to today, I think that you know uh, overall uh, we've been uh, you know developing our foundation within our organization. Uh, and really developing systems to be truly intergenerational, but also uh, developing a pipeline of folks to, to, uh, of young professionals to, to, to really, uh, you know, get socialized uh, within, you know, understanding um, how to uh, develop best practices in true partnership with the local community and fundraising. And so that, that has always been our emphasis, like the Black Gaming Circle, is to really uh, see eye to eye and also work side by side uh, with, with our local nonprofit organizations and leaders. Uh, specifically in regards to the present, um, we, one of the, our organizations that we actually, in, in actuality, uh, has, is a grantee uh, of ours for this year, the Asian Americans United. Uh, they had a, a town hall addressing the increase of anti-Asian violence um, you know, here in the United States, uh, I want to say this was back in March, and uh, and that they had, uh, I was one of the, the folks who actually viewed that, that, that uh, um, you know, video uh, and, and participated in the town hall, and uh, a, a very big member of our community had made a call out to uh, work with all the participating nonprofit organizations in that call to uh, fundraise together for the Asian American community, in this case, specifically for undocumented uh, individuals uh, who are literally, you know, the most uh, vulnerable uh, within the Asian American community. And so uh, that has been something that we, uh, you know, took to heart and uh, we partnered with APIP Philadelphia to see, you know, if that's something that they wanted to do. Uh, we checked in with our committee members as well to see if that, that was something that, that was worthwhile. Uh, also understanding that self-care is important too. So uh, we will not be, in a, we will not move forward if, if anybody or the collectively, we, we we're not positioned to move forward to, to, to help, uh, you know, others. But uh, fortunately, uh, we were. And uh, from there, uh, we expanded to not only undocumented, but immigrant and refugee communities. And, um, and we're, 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 you know, uh, moving forward um, in regards to that. Thank you, Peter. Just to, to recognize some of the comments, like Daria, thank you for your comment. Uh, Peter, I don't know if you saw that, but she mentioned your compassion is appreciated. Um, and I'll say that for myself as well, but I hear that from everyone um, in terms of, I think, a deeper, broader intentionality than just a transactional, we have money, we're going to give it out, right? Sometimes just how you may think about traditional philanthropy. And I just wanted to lift up a couple of key themes that you named in terms of origin story and current work. Um, Duane, you talked about um, 
funds meaning more coming from your communities, right? Or our communities. And there's a story there. Chanel, you talked about um, wanting to create this mechanism of a voice to share black stories from the community. So I think there's a, an interesting narrative there that giving circles are able to do that traditional philanthropy isn't quite doing, is not doing well, doesn't have on its radar. Melissa, you talked about broadening the definition of philanthropy, right, as one of the motivations for the origins of AMF. And Peter, um, other goals in addition to that are complementary to giving out funds in a meaningful way, intergenerational strategies, creating a pipeline of leadership. How, how folks, how, do, do folks know that giving circles are about all of these things? How much awareness do you feel like is out there around sort of the intentionality and design behind giving circles? What are your thoughts on that? Thank you for that, James. Um, so I'll say the black community has been quote unquote philanthropic forever. I don't think we call it philanthropy, but whether it's giving to your church or opening up your home to provide snacks or childcare, um, help so-and-so go to camp and we're donating money. So it, it, the language we need to acknowledge comes from kind of white dominant culture of this is philanthropy, this is how you do it, and it's so rigid. But the culture of generosity, um, of loving each other, of building community and relationship has been in the African American community forever. We talk about things that are bothering us, things that need to be done. Like we have opinions, we have voice, and we also have power with our dollars as well. So the giving circle, the model is really a place to bring yourself to be unapologetically black, to re elevate issues that are happening in society and talk about them in a very real and raw way. And then also a place of healing for us as we come together and convene and acknowledging what we can do to either put dollars back into our community to be able to change the narrative or add a counter narrative to what is out there in the media, but also how are we building each other up? So when we go back to our institutions or our day jobs, whatever you wanna say when we're not together, do you have that language? Do you have the courage? Do you feel like you have the power to speak up? Um, and, what do, and what does that mean and how can we make change, not only collectively, but in our prospective organizations and anyone can be a member. So if you are an applicant, if you are a grantee, um, whoever um, can be a member and it's a inviting, welcoming, warm environment that yes, we do have business that we need to carry out but it's also like we want to get to know you and who you are. And that's something that typically in traditional philanthropy, it focuses on the function of like, we need to give money, we have the power, we make the decisions, we, 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 it's about us and less about the community. Um, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a community, it's about relationship, it's about the individuals that are coming to, together. Reactions, thoughts to that? Melissa, it looks like you're, you're not that in your awesome. head. That was awesome. I have nothing to add. <laughs> Plus one, Chanel. <laughs> um, Dwayne, Peter, anything else to, to add to that? I, I, I just want to bring attention to the moment that we're in. And yeah. I know for the Black Giving Circle, um, and we'll talk about kind of future uh, actions and what's needed, et cetera. But we've received, you know, we started this campaign and without because we're all volunteers putting forth a tremendous we did it's a lot of work and effort on our behalf but it certainly wasn't like mass marketed and we didn't have all our strategies in place and we were like building our social media in real time as we're launching this new campaign um just because it hadn't existed in the ways that you know in 2020 require etc but we received like such an onslaught of, of attention just because of the moment that we're living in. And we have people, businesses, individuals who are looking for ways to 
address what's happening currently and being explicit like, hey, we want to give to black organizations in Philadelphia and like being that specific and like that type of intentionality just didn't exist. And I'm not, it existed within the black community, but a larger like white community is now looking for ways to get in the game. And I just, I worry that like this is like what's a fad and that, you know, because the moment is calling for it, that the intentionality is there, but I don't want to lose that. Like the issues that we're talking about, why we formed, existed, you know, since the beginning of the field of philanthropy, right? And uh, the commonality um, between the disparity in giving that I say the black giving circle, you know, is has formed in response to, the same thing is said. There's lots of data that shows that there is a giving gap to the Asian community as well. So like we have a lot of synergy based on need and disparity. But, you know, one of the reasons why we wanted to have this conversation today is to really be intentional and be unified and to like work on our relationship so it's not transactional. Like this webinar, it's not transactional. It's built on relationships that we've had over the years. And I can tell personal stories about how I've connected to Melissa and Kathy and, and Peter and also you, James. And it's, it's not just because, like, this is an opportunity for us to get in, in front of other folks and tell the story. We look at a deeper connection and, like, wanting to build our relationship in more significant ways in a long term. And it's a lesson, I think, for larger philanthropy. I agree with uh, Chanel and Dwayne on all of this. And I think that, you know, the trends and looking at the human aspect, uh, we, we struggle with the terminology of philanthropy as well uh, because it's, it's so rooted within, you know, uh, its relationship with race and racism in, in a way. And I think that, you know, uh, people, uh, again, I, I don't, I hope that this is not a trend. And I think that, you know, overall, like there's been some terminology that's being used such as like, you know, power sharing or what have you. Um, but I, 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 when I think of power sharing, you know, when I think about Americans' culture uh, in simplistically, you know, it's, it's really kind of like a bully culture in many ways. And so, uh, you know, when we're power sharing, you know, who gets to be in power? Are they going to keep the power with themselves or are they going to share or what have you? So I, I think that, you know, one of the big takeaways that I have in doing this work around fundraising and quote unquote philanthropy would be the, the emphasizing on the relationship relationship building aspect, right? So when you build a relationship, it's very human, you know, human to human, and seeing each other's humanity uh, in, in this regard too. So there's commitment, there's follow through, there's consistency, and then building trust as well. And I think that that's something that we need to hone in on uh, more, uh, more so than uh, really sort of like using buzzwords or what have you is really going back to the humanity piece. Well, let's, let's talk about liberation. <laughs> let's talk about liberation because I, I think this idea of narrative, storytelling, um, power, decision-making, redefining what philanthropy is, or actually to your very good compelling point, Chanel, naming what's been there all along, but having it be recognized differently in different spaces. Giving circles as a model, like a standalone model, can you talk about how uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color-led giving circles, how do they promote this idea of liberation for communities of color? And, and in terms of that word liberation, Sydney, I know you're on this call as well, um, and thank you for joining, but and I know that's a word and framing you've really put at the center now um, from Philanthropy Network, which is so compelling. How do we on this panel define liberation and what does liberation look like in the context of giving circle work? Anyone can take that up and then we can just kind of go free flowing from there. So we, we, oh, I'm sorry. We go had on. a, go Peter, no, no, you no, go. You go, you go, you go. No, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wait, wait. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll, I'll go. Uh, so when I, when I hear the word liberation, uh, and when I think it in a context of race and racism, I, I do think that, you know, uh, you know, our relationship, uh, you know, within the system is, is quite emotional, you know. Uh, it's, it's not really striving to be autonomous, 
uh, because when we talk about autonomy, uh, you know, we take away the human aspect of things. We all depend on each other. We all, you know, are related to each other. Uh, I think that, you know, it's, it's really sort of like uh, this practice of, you know, emotional uh, healing uh, in, in many ways. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I kind of think of it sort of like, you know, the, the how the, the system is developed. You know, researchers have, have really talked about sort of like this idea of racial tri triangulation, right? So racial triangulation on the other two ends is this idea of labor, uh, you know, that's, that's, you know, connected to all this. And then there's geopolitics, right? So geopolitics, meaning like United States involvement in the Vietnam War, for example, is one example. Or, you know, uh, Western Europeans involvement in diamonds in Africa, for example, right? So I think that, you know, really we have to sort of like, uh, work together to understand that, you know, we as uh, people of color are either othered, there's elements of genocide, when we talk about geopolitics and also domestically, but also enslavement. Thanks. So when we're talking about liberation and particularly as it relates to philanthropy, one of the things you asked about like how philanthropy is viewed kind of within like our community and too often i think that it's confused with charity and like you know just giving to a cause is fine i mean and there's need right and there's a whole coming from the food world like you have to feed the line where you're also looking to end the line um but too often we're so prone to just address the need and not look at what the problem is. And right now we have organizations that, again, are really uh, intentional and ambitious about supporting Black-led organizations and Black causes. And I would say that, you know, again, what happened in the spring and summer of 2020 to be the catalyst for this kind of intentionality were not new. Like these things have existed, you know, even if you want to just go back, you know, 27 years ago and look at like Rodney King, right? And, and, and the lack of acknowledgement when you see it on video that this is a problem and then the countless others, like, and the, the inability to, like, support organizations like Black Lives Matter because they were seen as being too controversial or, or not aligned with your priorities. Like, how, do they, how, does, how does this work suddenly become a priority for you? These issues aren't new. So I, I just say, I just question. So liberation is tied to people having everything that they need and, like, eliminating the need for that support. But it starts with people being funded in ways that are going to contribute to their liberation. So, and it, and it has to be like, you have to take risks. Yeah, it, it can't be what's popular. Yeah. You have to keep pushing the envelope and like look, look to where the hockey puck is going, right? As Wayne Gretzky was to say, not where it is. And that's yeah. how you become great in this work. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, it's real when you bring in a hockey metaphor, man. I, I think that's, uh, it's summer. A black man bringing up hockey, that's right. <laughs> Sue Van, all the way, man. He's, he's awesome. Um, well, question, Dwayne. Oh, can I just add? Or, yeah, all right, go, go on. ahead. Go, Melissa. Go, 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 go. I mean, some of the things that Dwayne said just prompted the idea about, about, about liberation and freedom and the, the approach, the kind of the underlying assumption of philanthropy is, is a deficit approach. And so what's really great about the giving circle approach is that the starting point is that of, um, of, of, of power and of richness. And that is kind of the beginning of liberation. Like uh, Chanel said the other day when we were prepping, she's like, the, the black giving circle is about liberation. And that was like, wow. You know, like these are our experiments, if you will, or expressions of liberation from um, uh, what you might call the, um, the different sources of oppression that philanthropy kind of embodies. And I mean that in like the very broadest sense. When you think about the things that underlie, like the values that motivate or that, um, 
um, that um, kind of um, operationalize philanthropy. They're grounded in just a lot of very um, uh, white, uh, white assumptions. And oppression is not, it's not about, and Peter laid out like a couple of different forms of oppression, you know, um, but it's also about general narratives and perspectives about, about people and about, about other people that are not part of the, the we of philanthropy that Chanel mentioned. So, you know, there's, there's, um, there's like exploitation, there's marginalization, there's a whole spectrum of oppression that I think that we need to kind of acknowledge in this whole philanthropic, you know, in this whole process of, process of philanthropy. So here, here's a, a bit of a um, sort of traditional statement slash question. Um, and folks who are listening, please kind of jot down ideas because we are going to get to the Q&A in approximately 15 minutes or so, but amazing conversation. So when you think about, you know, the, the giving circle as a model, um, friends, like, can you locate that for us in terms of where that fits within sort of how we would like to define philanthropy and giving? And we hear this idea of it's not charity because there's a lot of issues with that, right? Power dynamics, implicit, sort of white dominance, white culture, language. Um, and it, in many ways, it is about community and decision making and power. And Dwayne, like you, as you were saying, liberation, um, simply put, of people having everything they need people having everything they need, right? Um, is the giving circle the primary mechanism to get there? Yes or no? Um, in what way are you hoping giving circle work is reflective of a broader set of activities to make these broader changes for, for liberation? So I, it's, a, it's a bit of a gimme question, right? Because I, you know, I don't think any one thing or one a tactic is going to change everything. Um, but to find that for us a little bit, like what's your greatest hope for your participation in the giving circle work in greater Philadelphia? Let's locate it in our geography. Um, thank you for that question, James. Um, and I have a lot of things running through my mind, but really top of mind thinking about the giving circle it's one strategy to get us to liberation um and it's also a way to amplify or share our message but thinking very practically we give away a hundred percent of our proceeds philanthropy does not um so for a lack of a better phrase hoarding of resources when there is a need in the community is that loving mankind um someone put it recently like how am i honoring the black community when i show up to work is that a guiding question or the asian community the pacific islander like insert a community we say that we're working with or on behalf but do those communities have a voice in policy and structure and how the money is being spent in someone potentially that isn't of that community that is now um, ordaining a project or an organization to say, here's your value. I'm giving you a check for X amount of dollars. And there's research, 92% of foundation leaders are white. Nearly 70% of program officers at foundations are white. If we're fighting on behalf of these communities, but don't have a lived experience, maybe ignoring the structures and policies that are put in place, not having the willingness to sit in discomfort and to learn about the communities that you're trying to um, serve, to give dollars, to help liberate, um, and even philanthropy, traditional philanthropy, like do we have that um, model of like, are we trying to put ourselves out of business? Like a lot of foundations, their charter says we're going on in perpetuity. So that is a barrier um, of we can't spend all our money when there is a need or the board has the decision making power or they set the priorities. Who is actually on the board? And do they understand what is happening in the community? And is there um, an education or a feedback loop 
to where the key information or the things that are going on is happening or do we need data and to intellectualize what we see in the media or the protests to build a case that we need to change our funding priorities. So I think the giving circle is very nimble of here's what's happening, here's our lived experience, can we make a response? Um, with this giving pan campaign, we didn't have a traditional application process. We looked at what was happening in the media. We reached out to some organizations and had a call and made an appeal to the membership saying like, hey, here's what's happening. Here's what we're seeing. We talked to these organizations. Let's move some dollars. Can you donate? Can you share? So it was a very quick process, but it was not intellectualized. It was like this, we've been living this. It's just amplified because people are at home. It's amplified because unemployment is going up. It's amplified because of the leadership at the federal level and the lack of care that they have for our community. Um, so we should always be responding. We should always be fighting for freedom, for liberation, fighting against the systems that seek to um, limit us. But you have to acknowledge that the system exists and you have to acknowledge that there's discomfort and there's risk in, in, in it all and who is defining that risk. Yeah. Thank you for that, Chanel. Like everything you said plus some. Um, the one thing I will say, like the question around whether or not giving circles are the answers, I mean, we, we, we're we messing up as well. Like we don't have all the answers. Um, we Because so many of us are coming from philanthropy, there are lots of things that we have to unlearn ourselves. So we were very conscious of it, but we were also perpetuating some kind of broken cycles of like how we like send out RFPs and ask for people to apply and set up a committee to review. And we're trying to make it as equitable as possible, but like, you know, we don't know what we don't know. So we're on this journey and we're constantly looking to uh, evolve as well. Um, so I just want to say that um, one of the things like we're talking about even right now is when we started, we had classifications of people who were members. And if you, because it was our first year, gave $500, you were a founding member. And then if you gave 250, you were a voting member, but we will accept donations from anyone, but you only, but you, if you gave 250, you can have a vote. And like, you know, we, we were intentional about like how, having our applicants attend our event and connect with us in a really personal way, even if they weren't funded. And that was some appreciation around that because we were trying to show some solidarity and equity and, and pairing. But again, like we perpetuated some things that, you know, we in 2020 versus 2019 are, are rethinking. So again, you know, just continue to like press and try to figure out how to do it better. Yeah, I think that that's a powerful and, and, and humble statement as well, right? You don't have all the answers. Chanel, as you were saying, you know, it, it's one strategy to get towards liberation, but it, it's not the one sole vehicle because it has so many meanings, so many dimensions. And so let's shift a little bit, you know, from the idea in terms of value of giving circles towards liberation and communities of color um, to what we're calling traditional philanthropy, right? Of of which, as you were saying, Dwayne, many of us have worked within or still have relationships with, um, or um, in the case of Philanthropy Network, network um, really is helping to drive and educate and hopefully unlearn, right? <laughs> I love that, that phrase that you have there as well. What are the lessons um, and what are the possibilities for traditional philanthropy to learn from, incorporate, support, the this way of meeting community members needs and and putting power where it belongs in a way that giving circles are intending to do so in other words besides a standalone kind of model uh, of, of a giving circle what what is it what, what are the possibilities in its relationship to traditional philanthropy what are your hopes what are your recommendations Hey James, uh, I think that overall, uh, from my personal perspective, I, you know, it's it's 
it goes really about seeing the human humanity in everyone. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep on honing on to this and certainly you know, I'll mention this before and other folks too. And, you know, this is something that is not born um, within, you know, the history of philanthropy as well. So, uh, you know, white women came together uh, to raise funds uh, and, and volunteered for the local community. And uh, there was some sort of sense of collective community building uh, in that sense. Uh, and I, I wouldn't say that, you know, uh, it's too far off that, you know, uh, gender equity, you know, rights was uh, kind of connected uh, to that movement too, along with the civil rights era as well, I would say. Um, and I think that, you know, that that's, that, and what we find from the LGBTQ plus community is this term allyship. And so uh, that was a term that they really uh, honed in on. Uh, if we go back to the 80s, it, you know, LGBTQ plus, uh, you know, is a different sort of like relationship uh, to today, right? So uh, it's, we're, we're seeing, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, folks, including uh, bigger entities that are celebrating, you know, and this, this month is Pride Month as well. And, but uh, go, going back to this idea of allyship, it really goes down to core, you know, steps. I think is really to listen, you know, uh, how, and that's, that applies to all of us. Uh, because we're talking about, you know, as Dwayne is talking, mentioned earlier, centuries of, you know, systematic racism in this country. Uh, and the country has been founded upon it as well. It's going to take commitment and also years and generations behind us. Uh, you, know, we, you know, when we're dead, you know, it has to continue. And today is really has, we have to start that process. And so, you know, we have to listen. I think, you know, we have to process. Commitment is key to learning and continuing to learning. Uh, invite, uh, as, as Ashanal mentioned, uh, you know, there are certain ways that we need to sort of have equity. And in a city that's majority people of color, but also mostly black, you know, most boards should be reflective of that percentage of the citizens of the city. And, and but it's not. It's not, and uh, and the question is why, uh, and that's that's where we need to also partner, uh, and I think that that's the inspiration that we're striving within the Giving Circle is to really honing in on this on this on the spirit of partnership. It's not really charity top down, uh, you know, uh, just making ourselves feel better, but it's going to be a struggle to to really uh, break down. Uh, all of this generational and centuries of, you know, uh, of trauma and uh, for us to really build a strong foundation for healing. And I think that that's going to be it. Uh, community building is really founded on, uh, you know, healing, but also respect. Thank you, Peter. Others, comments to what, what Peter mentioned or, or your own sort of ideas kind of through your head now? So I agree with a lot of what Peter said and this idea of healing and respect and kind of acknowledging the human. Um, and I would add to that that we have put a stake in the ground of what we care about as the Black Giving Circle, as the Asian Mosaic Fund, as APIP. Um, and at times it feels like, Dwayne said it earlier, it feels like, oh, this is the hot topic or this is what is happening. I need to be responsive and only responsive until the media dies down. Um, so this is an opportunity for traditional philanthropy to put a stake in the ground and not move it. We know that social issues aren't solved overnight in six months in one year. So how are we fundamentally shifting our priorities, how we talk about things, where we're focusing and being intentional um, to combat a social issue, whether it's racism, anti-Black racism, um, injustice against the APIP community, whatever it may be, and really kind of going full speed ahead on, on that and not being afraid 
we don't have, we, in some level, I'll speak for myself, I don't have the privilege of being afraid of being black. When I walk out of my door, you see my skin, you see my hair, and assumptions are made there. So I have to live through that and lead, and I choose to lead through that and, ex and accept the good, bad, the ugly, and the indifferent. And we need foundations to put a stake in the ground. Um, and some have been doing that and some have been taking strides, but also this level of transparency of saying, we're learning, we're leaning, we're trying. We may not always get it right, but teach us, help us, and have that openness and willingness to be corrected, to get feedback, to be in relationship. Um, and then also to get folks in the door that identify with the communities, as Peter said, whether it's on the board, on staff, in leadership positions, and not just in entry level positions, um, and have a welcoming, warm environment where people can actually be themselves. We invite, we have that invitation of please be yourself. And then when someone shows you who they are, it's like, oh, well, I'm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not acceptable, that's not professional, that's not enter whatever, and that's, that's not, it. it was never acceptable, and it's no longer acceptable, especially in this moment, so we need to interrogate, and I'm included, our assumptions in where we are, so that we can be better collectively, so that we can put stakes in the ground, we can keep learning, and keep moving dollars, um, and being in relationship with the communities that we're looking to serve. So that real change can actually happen and it can also be sustained. Chanel, let's, I'm wondering if I can um, gently nudge you a little to talk about this idea of identity. And, um, you know, if, if this is not too personal, why did you get involved, right? And, and you're very busy, <laughs> uh, full-time program officer at, at Bells um, and are also taking leadership roles in philanthropy network um and then also with the uh, philadelphia black giving circle um how does your identity sort of inform your practices and why does it matter what that we interrogate really understand what we're bringing to the table and why so at the end of the day i think it leads to we're adding value um and sometimes our value isn't always appreciated externally or by other people or people that don't look at us look like us um so i'm enough and i'm valuable to be in this space and i have things to say and i carry a lived experience is kind of the quick of the why i'm here um but i grew up in the south and i grew up in a lot of white spaces and at a very young age probably first or second grade I was like, oh, I'm different. Like the world told me I was different and I saw that and I had to adapt. Um, and it's not something that I'm proud of, but what, how society is, it's you either adapt or you don't and you don't do well or you don't succeed, especially in the South. So I was always seen as that quote unquote token or likable person but when I got there, I spoke my truth, I shared my story, and I was able to open hearts and minds and build compassion for change and open conversations. So in this role in philanthropy, but in particular with the Black Giving Circle, it's an opportunity to build bridges, to share my story, but most importantly, I don't have to hide who I am. I can just be who I am and not have fear of retaliation um, and really work on issues that I care about, but also build strategies that I can take back to traditional philanthropy, build um, relationship to make changes in other places. So identity is, is very key and core, and I don't shy away from, I, I'm black. I don't shy away from, from that, and it is a grow, it took me to grow, to get to this point, to be able to say that, and to accept the, if there is retaliation, um, like I told my family a few months ago, I was like, if I say I'm coming home, don't ask any questions, just make the bed <laughs> because I have to live in a way that's true to who I am and where I can sleep at night and know that I'm actually fighting. And some people may say it's not enough or I'm conforming, whatever, but as long as I have peace with how I'm operating and I'm moving, I'm moving forward, then that's what matters. Um, and also learning and being in community to bring other voices into the room 
as well and also advocate for other people to be a part. Melissa, you want to say something there? No, again, I just give, give Chanel a plus one. We are grateful you were here, Chanel. <laughs> and to all of you, uh, folks, I, we could continue and we will continue uh, this conversation, but I did want to reserve, it's about 11.17 now, a good 10 to 13 minutes, if that's okay, Kathy, in terms of timing, um, for questions and answers. And um, two ways to do this, and Kathy will keep me honest, um, if you have a question for um, a specific panelist or just in general or reaction, um, if you can raise your hand. Kathy, actually, can I call on you to give people direct directions on how to best do that? Um, or to kind of uh, raise a question in chat, but Kathy, you're, you're most uh, familiar. Sure. Um, you can either post your question in the chat box, which we'll be monitoring, um, or if you click on participants on the black bar uh, down below, um, and then it'll pop up a sidebar to your right, and there are options underneath just click on more and raise your hand and we'll call on you. Great, so that the lines are open. Uh, so if you have uh, your hand open uh, up or if you wanna type something in the chat, um, please do. And I'm also very comfortable with silence. So it's okay to, to be silent for some reflective space too. So that's okay, everybody. Looks like we have one question and thank you, Stephanie, um, for that. Um, so the question um, for the panelists um, and maybe for everyone else and for, for yourself and self-reflection, Stephanie, thank you. Uh, what will it take for philanthropy to turn that lens inward? What does that look like? So again, what will it take for philanthropy to turn that lens inward? What does that look like? I think that there are lots of blueprints out there for philanthropy and, and frankly, like, you know, most institutions. Um, so it's a matter of one, I think, having a commitment to these issues. And that's at a personal as well as organizational level. It can't just be about the moment, right? Um, I don't know if people paid attention, but the uh, president of the, which foundation was that? The Poetry Foundation in Chicago recently resigned. So they made a statement that is like so many other statements at this moment, calling for advancing racial equity. They stand with Black Lives Matter and they put it out. Very simple and not controversial in this moment, but they got lit up. And people were like, how? Like, since when? Like, where, where are these values coming from? Because it's not showing up in your funding. It's not showing up in your support of black artists. And they received so much heat that he just had to resign. So I think it's a good lesson for philanthropy. Like, your, your, your values have to be showing up as an individual as well as kind of where your priorities are. And, and Chanel, you know, you talked about this complexity of who you are. And Du Bois talked about this double consciousness that we have seven versions of ourselves that we have to navigate and depending on who we're with is who you get to see. As a trustee of a philanthropic organization, I've walked past the president of that institution, not you, Sydney, um, and on the streets with other black men and they did not recognize me. They didn't look up to see that one of their trustees was like sharing the pavement with them, right? And because that their 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 gaze was trained to look down, and, and that's real. Like, it, and it's in, in, it's implicit, it's unconscious, but it's real. So you have to like put some work in personally, as well as you know, as an organization, to think about implicit bias. If it's not your priority, then find ways to make it intersect. 
Like that's that's it's real. Um, have this personal commitment and show up in who you hire. Allow them to bring their whole selves into the organization, not just certain kinds of people. And I can go on and on and on. But there are lots of resources. There are lots of people that can help you along this journey. But it does take an investment at a personal and organizational level. And that's a full investment, like, you know, in every kind of way. Got to put some work. Thank you, Dwayne. Other responses to that question? What would it take for Philanthropy to turn that lens inward? I really like what Dwayne had to say. And, you know, it's a, you know, add on. I think that is leading by example, you know, and like, you know, we, we pride ourselves on, on being, you know, leaders and potential leaders and, uh, you know, leaders, the definition is, is or the, the term is thrown everywhere. But what, what is true leadership? Really, you know, when we think of, you know, our, our, our own popular culture in this country, we think of, you know, the, 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 the heartwarming stories of those who really, you know, care, you know, for the common good for everyone, right? Uh, and it's, but somehow, you know, within those sort of like childhood narratives and stories, it just changes uh, as we get a, become adults. And that's going to be the sort of the healing. We have to sort of untrain our, 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 our minds in regards to that. Uh, I really go back to, you know, what, what, what is that humanity? Uh, and that, that I, I see a lot of great stuff coming from California, too. And, uh, you know, the, the, they're, they're really dismantling a lot of, like, these systems and to, 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 uh, that, that's, that's sustainable. And I think that that's going to be what we're going to need from here is everyone to collectively work with all of our resources to, um, to lead and develop new, something new. As, and something better. And Philadelphia is, has always been a leader in, in America's history, right? So why not, you know, do something, you know, now? I, I think that there's a lot of potential. We do need to invite more, you know, uh, folks. What I love about the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests, I attended the protests last Saturday around, in front of the, you know, Museum of Art. Uh, it was very intergenerational. You know, you had people who were, you know, teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, all together, all together. And, you know, it's, it's going to, it's, we're going to, we, like Dwayne said, we're going to have to commit, um, but, you know, uh, also lead by example. Thank Can you. I just add a practical yes. point? Just a very yes. practical point. Uh, uh, yes to everything that's been said. I, I just want to um, uh, underscore the importance of self reflection. Um, because that's that's so important in in understanding your implicit your internal biases and how your perceptions shape the practices that your organization um, undertakes and and how they give out money and who they hire and who they contract with and so the I think the danger is um, that people mistake attending a training for self reflection um, but really it's a constant education process like a daily reflection, a daily curiosity and wanting to learn. There's no substitute for that. Thank you, Melissa. And we have about five minutes left. We have one other question here from Sydney. Um, and that question is, how can Philanthropy Network better support giving circles? So I don't know, um, Sydney, if you're looking for um, specific structures, ideas, ways of taking the conversation, maybe all of the above, but panelists, what do you think? What's the wish list? What can we do? What can Philanthropy Network do? Well, I can't speak for everyone, <laughs> but I, I can, in a practical way, when we're, when Philanthropy Network is looking for board members, when they're looking for committee members, when they're looking for speakers, um, tap in to these networks and bring folks with different perspectives, different identities to the, to the events to speak, to elevate not only their cause, their issues, but elevate kind of the, the conversation we're having here. Like I would love to see this be integrated with traditional philanthropy and giving circles, not just here are the giving, the giving circles perspective, because everyone has multiple identities. Everyone sits in multiple places 
and how do we elevate also folks that um, aren't quote unquote the voice of the people or the usual suspects and how are we able to amplify model amplifying um, a variety of voices a variety of perspectives and practically like elevate to give I think someone said that but donation uh, donations can be made and larger grants can be made if foundations are looking at participatory grant making models or if they're looking at how um, we need we need board members blah 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 like don't let this just be transactional like give some funds be in relationship and be a part so we are coming to time um, i would like to do one round robin question at the end for all of our panelists and then i'll, I'll hand it over to you kathy um, but can everyone answer the question uh, or offer a sentence or two of what's next or what's a reflection uh, what's an action or what's a recommendation? One of those. Um, what's top of mind for you right now at the end of this conversation for us to all think about and reflect on? So let me give you, uh, everyone, about 15 seconds and maybe everyone on the call too, if you wanted to think that question through as well and jot down your own answer, that'd be amazing. Uh, but 15 seconds or so, and then we'll start with uh, Melissa uh, and then we'll go down the line. So what's next? Yep. I think, I think um, as Dwayne said earlier, and as, as a lot of people are coming, as we're kind of understanding on a daily basis, we're having a real moment here. And the real hope is that this moment isn't, you know, just a fad. So, and I, I have hope, you know, when you take away, yes, there's a lot of rhetoric, there's a lot of performance, um, but there are some folks and, and some actions where you see real progress. And so I think what's next for uh, groups like giving circles for philanthropy is figuring, figuring out a way to capture that energy and that commitment and not lose it and also to hold people accountable for the, 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 the many statements um, of black solidarity that were made in the, in the past couple of weeks. Thank you, Melissa. And then Peter, Dwayne, Chanel in any order when you're ready. Um, I think the, what's top of mind and what's next is, um, for me, it's just gratitude that this moment is bringing us to having, you know, the opportunity for real conversations in ways that we haven't. Um, you know, we had a, a real frank conversation about white supremacy within, you know, philanthropy and larger society, but, you know, philanthropy exists within society. But just being able to, like, have those conversations are just so important. Um, and I think and I hope that for everyone who's participating, that you are becoming more comfortable with these conversations and frankly, that you will start to be able to lead these conversations within your own networks. So we have a lot of work to do. We're certainly not there. Um, but I would love to see that, you know, everyone who is interested in these issues becoming champions and really start to drive change within their sphere of influence. I think that, you know, from my end, you know, what I've learned that this is a global movement and where the message is that this is that, you know, we need to support each other. We need to support each other authentically, genuinely, and commit to that. And like I said before, is not going to be in our lifetime. It needs to set a new standard that can be uh, generational from here on out. Uh, we need to commit to anti-racism. You know, and that's ultimately, you know, what we're all talking about is anti-racism. And that is a responsibility that's shared, uh, is not delegated to people of color to have to teach and what have you. Everyone needs to share that responsibility uh, wherever, you know, part of that journey you may be. Um, and then I think that, you know, as a microcosm with the philanthropy network, I, I think that if we're going to talk about the commitment of the Black Lives Matter movement and also people of color, but certainly directly black lives, then, you know, police brutality, global, uh, global policing, and, how, and it also relates to immigrants and refugees, also prisons, 
sex trafficking as well is is you know the livelihood of women lgbtq plus young people uh but also health you know uh we're with the COVID 19 we've seen that and so uh, i would say that you know overall uh it's not anti-asian anti-black whatever let's let's be anti-racist and share that responsibility and just what echoing what everyone said and if we could just really let go our of our fear of failure in this moment and move forward so that we can commit recommit go deeper into the work um and then be held accountable for the work for the statements for the things that we say we really want to do um and what does that accountability really look like so thank you all thank you peter thank you chanel thank you Dwayne. thank you melissa and kathy and philanthropy network kathy um over to you I just wanted to thank everyone so much today for joining, um, for taking an interest in community-led philanthropy, and a huge thank you, thank you to our speakers today, James, Dwayne, Peter, Melissa, Chanel. Um, we need to make sure that this isn't just a moment, um, to Peter's point. This is, this is a movement, and the work is ongoing. Um, so thank you again. Um, we will follow up. Uh, with some resources and some articles, and uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. <laughs>